the greatest common divisor between uh, E and the quotient of N uh, should be 1, which means that E is selected such that it's co-prime with the quotient of N. And as we said, the main idea is that the quotient of N is very hard to get because, uh, because of the fact that uh, N is very hard to factorize uh, to find what is the value for P and Q. So P, the value of P and Q uh, were uh, you know, private and uh, they, they were hidden. Uh, therefore, the quotient of N is very hard to calculate. Uh, and of course, as a consequence, E is also very hard to uh, guess uh, since we don't know uh, 5N or the quotient of N. If we, if we know the quotient of N, then uh, selecting E is very simple, as we will uh, find out today. Uh, there is a, a systematic algorithm to calculate the value of E and also to calculate the value of D. D is selected, D here is selected such that it's the multiplicative inverse of E, okay, modulo uh, totient of N. Okay, so all of this is based on the fact that the totient of N is very hard to, to uh, calculate. So, uh, as you can uh, imagine, the uh, So last time we started to talk about uh, chapter three, uh, public cryptography. Uh, so we talked about uh, a message authentication. So we talked about uh, the concept of uh, message uh, authentication uh, codes and the different methods to do that. And then we started to talk about uh, the first. Uh, public cri cryptography technique, which is RSA. We talked about the protocol, the six steps, and we verified or we proved the uh, reversibility for uh, RSA. And we started to talk about this uh, example. Uh, so uh, if you remember, we had two keys, uh, the private key and the public key. The private key is, uh, we called it E, uh, and uh, uh, E should be uh, selected such that the uh, the there is like the um, e may have uh, multiple uh, values. So if you know quotient of n and you can uh, of course factorize the quotient of n, then it's very easy to find uh, any number such that this number is uh, co-prime with uh, the quotient of n. So you could have multiple values, as we have tried last time. Uh, however, the, w once you select E, the calculation of D becomes unique. So the multiplicative inverse is unique. Okay? So this is uh, clear from this example. So if we select uh, P and Q to be uh, 17 and 11, and as we can uh, imagine last time when we talked about this example, 187 is N. So when I give you N, 187, can we factorize it? And actually, even with this low number, okay, uh, like visually, it's, it's also not very straightforward to get, right? But now we know that P is uh, 17 and uh, Q is, uh, is 11, which multiplied together at E, it becomes N. So N is factorized by these two prime numbers, 17 and 11. So once you know this, P and Q, well, the quotient of N becomes very easy because the quotient of N is actually P minus 1 multiplied by Q minus 1, as we did last time, which is 160. And 160 happens to know the number that we tried last time, if you remember. So if you, this is, this quotient of N is factorized as 2 to the power 5 times 5, if you remember, right? Which means that between, uh, 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 between the, uh, these numbers, we can select E using multiple ways, صح? There are multiple numbers that, that would be co-prime with this, right? That they, they, there is no common divisor, greatest common divisor with uh, 160. So you can select many, many numbers between 1 and 159, which is below 160, such that it's co-prime with, uh, with this uh, 160. So there, there are a lot. So if we, for example, take E to be 7, which is the example that we uh, had in the last uh, slide, okay? Uh, seven, of course, is not one of these uh, factorized prime numbers, in which case it's co-prime with 160, obviously, right? So in which case uh, 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 E is seven, and D, D is the multiplicative inverse of E modulo totient of N, 
okay? Which means that D times E uh, mod totient of N equals one, okay? So this, this means that D is the multiplicative inverse of E modulo E totient of, of N. So once we select E, the calculation of D becomes unique, okay? So E has multiple values, but D is unique. So once we select uh, 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 E as 7, D happens to be 23. How did we get this? We'll, we'll know uh, in the next uh, slide. There is, there is a systematic algorithm to get the multiplicative inverse. So again, there is a systematic algorithm to calculate the greatest common divisor, and there is a systematic algorithm to calculate the multiplicative inverse. Okay? But all of this is based on the assumption that we know Totient of n, but we don't know totient of n, which is hard to get, right? So all of this is based on the fact that we, we know p and q, basically. So there is no algorithm to... to exhaustive, the, the exhaustive search, exhaustive search. Oh. To guess p and q, yani, from the value of n? Totient, totient of n. The totient of n? It's, 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 no, not to guess, it's, well, it's, no, what, what, you, what you should try to guess is the value of p and q from n. Okay, it has to be it has to be based on trial and error. It has to be exhaustive. Yeah, because remember here we're talking about n being like three hundred digit number. It's like very huge. Okay. So there's no there's no algorithm to simplify this process. No. At least until today. طبعاً الناس بتوعكم طبعاً هقول لك يعني this is piece of cake. <laughs> okay. Once, once we have the uh, D, خلاص, the, the private key becomes the value of E and the value of N. N, I'm sure of N. But you that, I'm sure of N. Very clever, yeah. Okay. So uh, E and uh, the value of N, and the public key becomes the, sorry, the I, the public key becomes the D and the value of N. So the extended Euclidean uh, um, algorithm talks about how to calculate the greatest common divisor, okay? And then the reverse operation allows you to calculate the multiplicative inverse, okay? So if we, if we want to calculate, we said we can easily get the value of, of E based on the fact that it should be co-prime with Totient of n, so it's 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 easy. So once we select e, we want to calculate the multiplicative inverse, and the way to do that is just to try to calculate the greatest common divisor between e and 160, which we know it's one. We know it's one, okay? But we need to calculate it so that once we do the reverse operation, we'll show you how to guess or calculate the value of d based on this simple algorithm. And the way to do that is that we want to get the greatest common divisor between uh, 7 and 160. So the algorithm talks about the fact that, okay, so you have to uh, represent 160 as a multiplication, as like 7 multiplied by i, any i, plus value. And any number can be, can be represented using this simple linear equation, taban. okay? But once we do this, then the theory, the theory here is that this greatest common divisor is reduced to this greatest common divisor, which is between 7 and 6. So 7 and 6. So the greatest common divisor between 160 and 7 is reduced to the greatest common divisor between 7 and 6, which we know it's 1. Okay. So the greatest common divisor between 7 and 6, again, to represent 7, okay, as a multiplication of 6 plus a number. And that's easy, as you can see. It's 6 plus 1. So we know that 7 is 6 times 1, and i here is 1, yani, plus 1. Okay? So that's, that's easy, and we know, we know this. We know that we can, once we, we, khalas, once we, we get the greatest common divisor between 7 and 6 as 6 and 1, so we know it's 1. Any, any greatest common divisor of a number with one, it's one. Okay? Why did we do this? Why did we do this? 
not because we, we, need to go, we need to get the value of the greatest common divisor, really. It's, it's because of the second thing. Okay? Type. In order to get the multiplicative inverse of 7 modulo 160, then we need to get a value here. Okay? This is the multiplicative inverse, mod uh, 160, right? Okay? Such that this is equal 1. What does that mean? This means that this one, this one is actually is represented as a multiplication of 7, okay, plus 160 times something. So this is the A, or in other words, 160 is 160, is 7 multiplied by something plus 1. That's the, the, the basic definition of mod, right? So what we did here is that we, uh, we have moved this here. That's the only thing. Which means that we expect here to have like some negative number here, for sure. So we'll see that. So what we need to do is to, is to, is to find the number here. Okay, this is D, Yani. Mashi? Type. So the way we do this is by saying, okay, so let's do the reverse operation of the Euclidean uh, algorithm that we did here. We know that 7 is represented as 6, six times 1 plus 1, right? This means that 1, okay, can be represented by this, right? So 1 is 7 plus 6 multiplied by minus 1. Sahkira? Okay. So that's, that's, that's simple. Right. Okay? Which means that we know that, um, so here, this is, the, this is minus 1. So we know to, we go to the next equation here. So this 6 can be represented by 160 minus, or 160 plus 7 times minus 22. Right? Okay? So if we reduce this, we come up with 7 multiplied by a number and 160 multiplied by a number. And this is what we want to achieve here. Right? This is what we want to achieve here. Okay? So we need to know about what is this number. Because this is D. Right? Okay? So it turns out that 7 and here is 7, which means that this is like 23. Because it's minus 1 multiplied by minus 22. This is a 22, right? And, uh, and here is 7, which means that this is a 23. Plus 160 multiplied by minus 1. Once we reach that, so it's done. So the value of D is, a, is 23. Totally. Is there only one solution to this equation? Yes. There is a theorem that proves that the multiplicative inverse is unique. The value of E can be multiple values. But once you select E, D becomes a Okay, there is a systematic proof for this. So theoretically, I can just try and come, yani, come to the same number, 23 and negative 1. If I just try uh, number to satisfy this equation. La. Uh, that's what la, I mean. la, 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 la. What, what do you mean by this? Uh, 1 equals 7, a number A, for example, plus 160B. No, no, we are here, we are just reversing what we have done here. So we are replacing, like for example, we are replacing the, um, so here, we know that 1 plus 6 is 7, صح? So 1 is 7 minus 6, which means 6 times minus 1. So, صح كده? And we want to keep the 7 all the time. We want to keep the 7 all the time. Why? Because eventually what we want to get... 7 times something, and this something is the multiplicative inverse. Okay, so we want to keep the 7 all the time. And we want to reach to 160. So the way we do that is just to go backward here. We go backward in these equations. Okay, that's why we did the, the Euclidean distance allowable. And then this, this is called the extended Euclidean distance. This is called the Euclidean, Euclidean distance is used to calculate the greatest common divisor systematically of any two numbers, okay? And as we said, we can guess the value of E easily because we know the totient of N and we know how to get 
a number which is co-prime with Toshintoven. That's easy. Okay? So we try the Euclidean algorithm systematically to calculate the, this great, greatest common although we know it's one. <laughs> right? But the idea is that if you go reverse, you will get the multiplicative inverse of 7. This is the extended Euclidean algorithm, which is used to calculate the, the multiplicative inverse of a number. Okay? So this is how to calculate the value of d. Any, any, any confusion, any question for this? It's supposed to be systematic and easy. Yani. Okay? Taban, of course, if you do this for a big number, it's something else. You have to do yani, it. But, but the same steps can be done using a program. Easy. Yani, we don't have to do manual all the time. Yani, in the exam, I can give you a small number to try it manually just to see whether you understand the concept or not. But of course, taban, when we try it in big numbers like this, we can do this. Uh, programmatically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why can't we get quotient of n? Totient, totient of n. We you get the totient of n if you know the, P, the value of p and q. And in order to know the value of p and q, you have to factorize n because you don't have the value of p and q. Mm -hmm. You don't have the value of p and q. p and q are supposed to be a hidden. So and it's just in one node. Every node will select locally the values of p and q without telling anyone about it. Okay? I give you the value of n. Okay? Can you guess p and q? Theoretically, you can. But is there a systematic algorithm to do that, which is uh, polynomial uh, in nature? No. There is no polynomial time uh, uh, algorithm that allows you to factorize a big number like this. Okay. Type. This is this is uh, the end of RSA. So we talked about RSA. RSA again is a general purpose public cryptography technique, which means it can be used for uh, encryption and decryption. It can be used for, uh, as we will see later, it can be used for key distribution and it can be used for message authentication codes, as we have explained last time. So it can be used for everything. Okay. Duffy Hellman on the other side was the first algorithm okay, uh, to be published in the, in the public cryptography category. Duffy Hellman, unlike RSA, is not to be used for, for general encryption and decryption. It can only be used for key distribution. Only. And we'll see how. So this is very important. So the purpose of the algorithm is to enable two users to exchange secret key. That's the main idea behind it. The algorithm itself is limited to exchange to uh, the exchange of keys. Yani it doesn't have any other usage other than the exchange of keys. It depends on, in, in, uh, on its effectiveness, on the difficulty of computing the dis, uh, discrete logarithm. So the idea is based by, not by on factorizing prime numbers. It's not about this. It's a totally different theory. Okay, so it's based on what we call uh, discrete logarithm. So if I give you, if I give you, mass and two numbers, let's say, let's talk about two numbers, a to the power x equals y. Okay, so I give you the value of a, I give you a value of y, for example. Okay, Maybe. and I ask you to calculate the value of x. Is this easy? Yes, of course. From this, x equals a log y divided by log a, right? So, okay? If you take the log, I can calculate x very easy. So, what if I do this? a to the power x mod n equals y. Okay? Here, I give you the value of y. I give you the value of a. I give the value of n. Okay? What is the value of x? I totally take the logarithm. We can't. Then this is the. This there is mod n here. Okay. So this is called discrete logarithm. It's not the normal logarithmic system that we are used to. This is called discrete logarithm. Okay. So 
it, it ends up that this, in order to know the value of x, again, you have to resort to exhaustive search. Okay? So you have to, to solve it numerically, which means that you try x1. Okay? And then you see, do you reach the value of y or not? You try x2. Particularly, ba, if you, if you, if you uh, yeah, on its own, this problem is difficult. Okay? Another, another difficulty uh, factor here is that, well, if you, maybe there are two values of, of x that would lead to the same y, right? So there is another difficulty dimension here, which, which means, or which states that a, if a is primitive root of n, what does that mean? Then a, a to the power x mod n, e uh, always reach to y such that y is different for each value of x. So for each value of x, y is actually unique. Okay? Which means that if I give you a and n and y and tell you and tell you this information, a is a primitive root of n. Okay? Then you can resort to the exhaustive search and you are confident that there should be there should never be two values of x that would lead to y. Never. Okay? Yeah, I must if I uh, just a simple example. If I, if I tell you 3 mod 2, what is this? 1. Okay? Type 3 to the power 3 mod 2. What is this? 3 to the power 3 is 27, right? Mod 2 is a is 1. Okay, so then for x equal to 1 and x equal to 3, we have reached the same number. Does that mean that 3 is primitive root of 2? No. Okay, so for that, 3 is not a primitive root of 2. Because for different values of the discrete logarithm for x, okay, we have reached the, th the same number. Okay, but there are many uh, pair of numbers such that these two numbers are, are primitive root of each other. So how can we find out these numbers? There are lookup tables for this. There are so many lookup tables for this. Okay? That's easy. Because remember, these two numbers are known. Are known. Okay? And we know they are primitive root. But to calculate the value of x, Okay, that, that requires an exhaustive search. But um, there's no systematic polynomial time algorithm to calculate this discrete logarithm without having to do exhaustive search. We just have to try. Okay? So this is the main idea of Diffie-Hellman. This is different from factorizing prime number. This is based on the discrete logarithm. Okay. Okay. So based on that, what is, what, is the, what is the protocol? What is the technique itself? So the, te the technique is very simple. So we now, unlike Yani, pay attention to the assumptions here and the differences in the assumption between Diffie-Hellman and RSA. So here in Diffie-Hellman, we select also two numbers, layer alpha and Q, okay? But this alpha and Q, unlike RSA, is known to both sides. So it's known to both sides. So alpha and Q are known to Alice and Bob. That was not the case for RSA. Okay? Not only that. Alpha and Q, alpha is a primitive root of Q. What does that mean? This means like, oh, مثلا, 3 is a primitive root of 353. Okay? How did I know? I, I, I didn't know that, but there is like lookup tables to do this. So this means that if you try x with all values 
from 1 all the way to 353 values okay all the way طبعا هنا في yeah all the way to to uh, uh, n minus 1 yeah, to 352 okay so if you try x with 1 all the way to 352 you will always get here a different number خد بالك بقى in any permutation it doesn't have to be ordered in any way as you can see here is 3 9 27 154 and then it comes back to whatever number so in any permutation it doesn't have to be a in order in a specific order it has to be unique okay so this means that 3 is primitive root of 353 okay so then the value of alpha could be 3 and the value of uh, uh, q could be uh, 353. So this, this is like an example of alpha and q and how they can be selected. That's, that's a primitive example. Type. So what is, what is about the technique? The technique is based on the fact that in uh, Alice will select, will select xa. Lower x at Alice. Okay? Alice will select x such that, of course, x is a is less than uh, uh, q. Uh, it's less than Q, of course. Maybe. And then alpha, uh, sorry, Alice can calculate alpha to the power XA mod Q. Can Alice do that? Of course. Right. So we can do that using calculator, using any algorithm. We can do that. So we can cal calculate the value of Y. Y at Alice. Okay. And then Alice can share YA. Maybe. So now Bob, remember, Bob has YA and has alpha and Q. Can Bob guess the value of XA? No. And Bob doesn't need to do that. Bob will, will, will do the same thing similar to Alice. Bob will, will, will ag again calculate the value of xb, x at bar, right? Which is also private, okay? And we'll do the same thing, we'll reach to yb. And then Bob will send yb to Alice. Can Alice know the, the value of xb from yb? No. But again, Alice doesn't have to guess the value of b because we don't need to reverse anything. There's no, it's, there's no encryption and decryption here. That's not the purpose. Okay? Then, what, what we need to do on both sides is that once Alice receives YB, Alice can calculate YB to the power XA, which is again private to Alice, mod Q. And that will, will reach to a number, right? It happens by that because of this matter, technique, if, if Bob calculates YA, which is exchanged from Alice, okay, to the power of XB, which is calculated at Bob, mod Q, it will reach to the same number. So this number has been exchanged indirectly, okay, and both of them, they don't know XA or they don't know XB, okay, but they have exchanged a number secretly, Okay, so even if there is any Avis dropper who knows YA or who knows YB or he knows both <laughs> and he knows the uh, alpha and he knows Q, okay, they cannot guess XA or XB, in which case they cannot calculate this key, the secret key. Come on, the proof that the, 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 this value will reach to k is very simple because you can say that, okay, so alpha to the power xb, which is here, alpha to the power xb mod q, this one, okay, to the power xa, which is here, okay, mod q. So this will lead to the fact that, of course, because of the multiplicative property of the uh, modular arithmetic, okay, so this exponent can get inside the mod, right? So we talked about that last time. Which means that alpha to the power xb times xa, okay, can be reversed. So this is the value of a. 
of Y-A, right? Okay, which is the same value that we calculate here, which is X, which is, sorry, a K, okay? So we can prove easily that if we exchange YB and we use XA or we exchange YA and we use XB, we'll reach to the same number. Actually, on both sides. So this way we implicitly or indirectly exchange a secret value, okay? And even if we exchange YA and YB and even if there is any Evis dropper who knows everything, he or she will not be able to guess what is the value of XA or XB, in which case they cannot calculate the value of, of K by any means. Based on the assumption of the discrete level. Any, uh, any questions? So XA and XB is the... Yes, this is the only thing that's unknown. So XA is only known by Alice, and even Bob doesn't know it. And XB is only known by Bob, and even Alice doesn't know it. That's the only thing that's missing. So, but remember, XA and XB are the exponent, right? And as we know, estimating this exponent will have, yani if Bob, using YA, wants to get what is the value of XA, he cannot. He cannot. So, similarly, if Alice wants to guess the value of XB, she cannot. So, because this is the, the discrete exponent that we talked about, and the discrete logarithm is very, very hard to get, numerically. So they only have to resort to exhaustive search in order to guess the value of XP. Theoretically, it's possible, but يعني, again, uh, it will take you يعني, uh, exhaustive search to do it, and good luck. I mean, again, we're talking here about numbers of 300 digits. So to calculate these values, it's very, very hard. Any, uh, any question? So just by making, of course, just by making alpha as a primitive root of Q, this means that the value of, uh, uh, of XB is unique to get to K. So the value of XB is unique, and the value of XA is unique to get to K. Right? Right? Any, uh, any questions? So, the good news is, Defi Hellman is very good, okay, and very robust against eavesdropper attacks. Eavesdropper, well, passive attacks, okay? So even if the, if the, if the uh, eavesdropper knows the value of YA, or knows the values of YB, or knows the both values, doesn't matter, okay? They cannot guess neither XA nor XB. You cannot do that. Hence, they cannot calculate the value of K. Because in order to calculate the value of K, you need to know at least one XA or XB. Okay? So the good news is that Diffie-Hellman is very robust against the uh, passive or uh, the uh, eavesdropping attack. However, the bad news is that uh, Diffie-Hellman can be easily fooled by active attacks or what we call man-in-the-middle attack. So if we assume that Darth, okay, is in the middle, okay, so in fact, Darth can read YA. Anyone can read YA, right? But the, the trick here is that Darth can say, oh, okay, so here is the value of YD, okay, and uh, gives it to Alice. So this way, it forces Alice to create a key that's exchanged between Darth and Alice, right? And another key which is exchanged between Darth and Bob, right? So this way, Darth can in fact intercept any message, okay, using the key, which is exchanged between Darth and Alice, right? And be able to decrypt the message and know what's inside. And similarly with Bob, right? Maji? So, Defi Hellman is robust against the eavesdropping attack, but it's not robust against a man in the middle attack. Man in the middle attack can easily break this loop and uh, 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 exchange keys with Alice and Bob. Nothing will stop this from happening. So, what will stop this from happening, Ba? 
How, what, what is the missing component here that we need to have Iba? Authentication. authentication. Message authentication codes. Right? So we need to have message authentication between Alice and Bob, okay, in order to authenticate Alice to Bob and Bob to Alice, in which case, even if we have Darth in the middle, Darth will not be able to, eat, to, uh, to authenticate himself to, to either of them. So, so Diffie-Hellman is good, right, to exchange keys, but it needs to be integrated with message authentication in order to prevent man in the middle of that. So that's possible. It's, it's not to say that Diffie-Hellman is, is bad or it's not usable blacks. It, it's, as we will see later, it's being used in many of the uh, security protocols that we will talk about. It's integrated in, in, in many of them. But it has to be integrated with message authentication codes. It has to be. Mishi? Any any questions? So far so good? Mishi. Tfaddal. Now, of course, we talked about, about message authentication in the beginning of this chapter. There are three ways. We use hashing, we use secret values. You were, you were not here last. <laughs> but this is on recording. Because we talked about message authentication. If we have message authentication with Defi Hellman, then خلاص, يعني, things are solved. And in fact, this is what many security services and protocols they do. They have Defi Hellman for key exchange, but at the same time, they have message authentication. But message authentication itself requires a key. صح? صح كده? فهي chicken and, and egg problem. صح؟ صح. So we, we still need to again exchange some key <laughs> that we can use to have message authentication codes in order to have Diffie Hellman uh, working to exchange a key. Okay? <laughs> so we'll see how, how we would do this in the next chapter. Mexico? Mm -hmm. in all now, XA, XA is, is, is selected locally. Nobody else knows about them. Alice has XA, Bob has XB. So, and all my communication no, I don't have to communicate while XA or XB. خالص, خالص. And once I calculate K, by the way, I don't need neither XA nor XB, nor YA nor YB. خلاص, and I exchange key. From now on, I will use this key to encrypt all communication. I don't use XA and XB for communication in any way. I'm just using Diffie Hellman to have, like, to exchange secret value, okay, based on the concept of discrete logarithm. Well, once I calculate this, this uh, secret value between A and B, خلاص, I don't, I don't need that, ولا XA, ولا XB, ولا YA, ولا YB. I don't need all of this. خلاص, I use the K, the value of K, to encrypt that all the upcoming messages. خلاص. Yes, the same key for all yes to, all, to all the upcoming messages, to encrypt it. Defi Hellman is not used for encryption. It's not for encryption. Defi Hellman is only used for key exchange. بس. That's it. It's not used for encryption in any way. RSA is used for encryption. Okay, and that's why they, we had to prove that reversibility. Because we have... Uh, Encryption, we have decryption. So decryption, you have to calculate the same value and so on. So there is reversibility, uh, reversibility, and we proved that last time. But here you don't have reversibility. You don't have to, you, you don't have actually encryption and decryption. You cannot do, use it for encryption and decryption. Okay? Taib, so uh, another, uh, another standard, which again is published in uh, uh, in FIBS, FIBS طبعاً, it belongs to A to NIST. طبعاً. So as part of the FIBS standard 186, they talked about digital signature standard. And the, the original or the first version of this was just trying to standardize SHA-1 okay, to calculate a hashing value. And remember, hashing can be used to calculate a lower message digest to uh, 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 guarantee a Integrity, right? 
there is no حتى message authentication code there is no authentication part of it okay so at the beginning the DSS or the digital signature standard so FIBS they were trying to just use uh, uh, the DSS standard to standardize the technique which is called SHA-1 we talked about that last time okay to calculate uh, message digest using the technique what we, what we call a digital signature algorithm or DSA Okay, so this uh, DSS was originally proposed in one nine, uh, 1991, okay, and has been revised in 1993. They, in 1993, they tried to, uh, to add the authentication part to SHA-1, okay, similar to what we have done for HMAC and, and CMAC, remember? So for HMAC and CMAC, okay, HMAC and CMAC uh, has a complete message authentication uh, codes. So DSS, when it started, it didn't have the authentication part of it, but in a later stage, they have included also the authentication part of it. Okay, type. So unlike RSA, it cannot be used for encryption or, or key exchange. So what we are trying to say here is that be aware in the fact that some cryptographic techniques can be used for encryption and decryption. Okay, some of them can be used only for key exchange, but not for encryption and decryption. Some of them can be used only for calculating the digital signature or the, uh, 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 the message digest to guarantee a confidentiality, but not for key exchange, nor for encryption and decryption. Okay, so pay attention to what each one is used for. Mishi? This is because of the nature of this. Again, the, uh, uh, neither Diffie-Hellman nor hashing techniques in general, they provide any kind of reversibility. In fact, hashing was actually to try to avoid the possibility of reverse engineering. And as we said, one of the requirements for hashing is never to be able, or not never, I mean, never say never, but it's not, yeah, it's, it's, it's to make it very computationally hard to reverse engineer the message just by knowing the hash. Okay? It's, it's one of the requirements to make it computationally very hard. Type. So, uh, so Nestba, as we said, they define the digital signature as the result of cryptographic transformation of data that, when properly implemented, provides a mechanism for verifying origin, authentication, data integrity, and uh, signatory non repetition in, in, in that, with that definition, that definition actually requires authentication. Okay? It does require authentication. So the first version of a DSS did not include any kind of authentication. So here we need to, a, to verify the source of the message. We need to have non repudiation non repudiation means what? It means that when a source sends a message, they cannot deny after that that they have not sent this message. Okay? So we can verify the authenticity of the message to come only from that source and not anyone else. Similar to when you go to the bank and you sign, for a transfer request. And later on you say, oh, I did not authorize that transfer. No, you did, because your signature, the bank signature is on that transfer. So you cannot deny that you have done this. Okay? So that requires some kind of, a, of authentication. So thus, a digital signature is a data-dependent pattern generated by an agent as a function of a file, message, or so. Yeah, so uh, uh, FIBS uh, 186 specifies the use of one of these three digital algorithms. The DSA is for signature, but also it defines the use of either RSA or elliptic curve okay, techniques to, for digital signature and authentication as well. Okay, so you can, in fact, use, and we have talked about how to use public cryptography for message authentication codes, right? Last time we talked about the three methods, one of them is to use which, uh, which key for, uh, for, for authentication. We use which key at the source and which key at the destination. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, which private key or public key. We, 
Ah, so we have to encrypt the message public. using the? For authentication yeah. private key. Private key. For authentication private key. Authentication. Right? So we calculate the hash, okay? And then we have to encrypt the hash using private key. Okay? So private key is used for authentication at the source. Okay? Then anyone else can verify that this is coming from you by using the public key. So we'll talk about this. So that's the graph here. That's the, that's the figure or the security model that defines that. So, so, the, the, uh, uh, so here, this is the message. And then we calculate. The message could be encrypted or not encrypted. That's not our job here. The message itself could be encrypted or not encrypted. Doesn't matter. But here, we, we, do the, we calculate the cryptographic hash. And then we use the digital signature using the, the private key. OK? So for authentication, we use the, the private key. So after we encrypt the message, after we encrypt the message, and again, the standard here does not dictate one certain algorithm. Could be RSA, could be uh, uh, elliptic curve. Okay? The standard does not dictate a specific technique. Okay? So we, uh, we encrypt the hash okay, using the private key, and then we append it to the message. So this hash, or this uh, 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 added part, it actually guarantees both uh, things. It guarantees the integrity of the message, and it also guarantees the, the authenticity of the message. So it guarantees those two things. At Alice, in order for Alice to verify that this is coming from Bob, what Alice does is that it actually creates the hash, so it, it actually keeps the, 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 this part, it keeps as is, okay? It puts it in the buffer, and it, it processes the message as if it doesn't see the, 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 the message authentication code at all, okay? So at the end, it just matches, okay? So this part will be separated, and then the message will, will take the message and then will calculate the hash. And then here, we, uh, uh, we look at the, uh, the, we use the same technique to, a, to encrypt the hash as if we are generating everything from scratch. And then we match both. Or we take this and we decrypt it, and then we match both. Either way, doesn't matter. Either you encrypt the hash or decrypt the, 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 the message authentication code that comes with the message. It doesn't matter you do which, because again, encrypting or decrypting, it's the same. Meshi? So here there is a, a verification step based on that E. We can uh, verify the authenticity and the integrity. So here we, we, we uh, guarantee three things here. The message was created by a known sender, which is the authentication part. The sender cannot deny, which is non-repudiation. Okay? Non-repudiation comes from where? from the fact that no one can generate this Mac except you because you have the key. Private this private key, no one has it but you. Meshi? And the message was not altered or the integrity part. So authentication, non-reputation, and integrity. All of these three are guaranteed because of this. Again, this is not something new, by the way. We talked about message authentication code. This is just one of the examples of a standard that uses messages, message authentication codes. So this is the summary of, uh, of chapter three. Uh, uh, the chapter three is the end of part one. Okay, is the end of part one. So this ends the, uh, the discussion about the security mechanisms. So here we covered, yani, up to this part, this is, by the way, uh, a short course for applied cryptography. Applied cryptography, they cover these three chapters. So here we talked about the uh, approaches to message authentication. We talked about message authentication codes and how we can do the message authentication codes using three different methods and what are the pros and cons for each one, whether we use symmetric keys, public keys, or we use secret value okay, to avoid the, the complexity of uh, encryption and decryption. Uh, we talked about uh, secure uh, hashing. We talked about SHA1, SHA2, and so on. We talked about digital signature, com uh, verifying or 
guaranteeing the message integrity. We talked about uh, HMAC and CMAC for, uh, as two techniques or two mechanisms to calculate the message authentication codes. We talked about public cryptography, public key cryptography. We talked about RSA, and we talked about Diffie-Hellman and what each one is used for. Okay, and these are the ton. The book does not cover uh, the whole elliptic curve part, so elliptic curve part we will not uh, discuss it as part of the course. So, uh, so I guess we'll try. Anyway, uh, so again, chapter four is the beginning of part two, and in part two, we'll start to talk about uh, security services, but not mechanisms. Um, so, uh, and again, the book follows the approach of trying to group things based on the functionality. So, we talk about key distribution and user authentication. And when we when we talk about user authentication, this is this is fundamentally different from message authentication. Huh? We'll talk about this is totally different. Huh? So, uh, user authentication is the first step. Okay. Uh, that we do for key distribution. And we'll talk about how we do this. Okay? So again, the book takes the approach of trying to group things based on the functionality. Because really, we, 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 uh, uh, we, we do key distribution through user, user authentication. Or together, we do it together. Right, so, so in most of the computer security context, user, authentic user authentication is the fundamental building block and the primary line of defense. Actually, يعني, we cannot emphasize enough the importance of user authentication. Because user authentication, the, the, the very clear example to that is to present your credentials in terms of user ID and password to assist them to authenticate yourself to assist them. This is user authentication, right? So it's the first line of defense in the sense that you know, if this is broken, or if somebody knows your password, then they have broken everything. <laughs> so they can get a hold of the keys, they can get all the communication uh, tapped into, they can do active attacks, passive attacks, they can do whatever. They know everything about you. So that's why it's the first line of defense. If this actually breaks, everything uh, after that falls apart. So user authentication is the basis for most types of access. So when you present your credentials, or you present yourself to a system to gain access to a particular uh, part of the system, whether it's a file or uh, a database or a network resource or something like that, or a website or something like that, that's the main uh, uh, method through which you gain control to any part of the system, okay? Which is also used for accountability. So, uh, so, well, t taking the privilege, for example, we can give some privilege based on your authentication or based on your user, user credentials. We can give you a privilege to be like a root uh, user or uh, admin user. And that has certain responsibility. So if you are an admin of a system and then you break the whole, the, the, the system is broken, you will, you will be held accountable for this. So RFC, when we say RFC, this is a done by a IETF. Okay, so RFC defines user authentication as the process of verifying an identity claimed by or for a system entity, which means that uh, the, the, uh, uh, the user uh, authentication is the way to verify, okay, uniquely, hopefully, and uniquely, we'll talk about يعني, why hopefully, we can uniquely verify the identity of a person, okay? Based on that, based on this identity of the person, then we give that person access to a certain resource, whether this is a file or a part of the, any entity, okay? It's a server, it's a website, things like that, okay? So that involves two things, the identification step and the verification step. By identification, we mean what? The system, la, layer registration part. Okay? A registration part. Like, like, create a new, uh, new account. Okay? 
<clears throat> by creating a new account, you are trying to uniquely identify yourself to the system. Okay? So presenting an identifier to the security system. Okay? So that, that step is a prerequisite so that you can gain access to a specific part of the system. So when you, when you try to gain a specific part of the system, then we have to do a, a verification step. We have to verify that this is exactly you and no, no, no one else. Like, for example, uh, you want to have, for uh, uh, Gmail service. So what do you do? The first step is to have to, to create an account. Okay? By creating an account, hopefully the system will be able to uniquely identify you. Okay? By uniquely identifying you, it actually it requires from you certain information, and that, that's variable from one system to another. Sometimes this information is loose. Sometimes this information is extremely rigorous. So, so when you identify yourself, or you, when you do, when you create an account on, on Gmail for any Google service, right, then you can put, uh, my name is uh, XYZ. So, uh, this is my personal email and so on. Yet, okay, so you can get by and the system creates a unique email for you, a unique user ID, okay? So regardless of the information that you present to the system, okay, whether it's loose or rigorous or, 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 right? We give you a unique identifier that uniquely identifies you, okay? So if you want to gain access to a particular service, then you have to provide your identifier to the system. We verify that this is you, and then we give you access. So these are the two steps that we need to have. Okay, clear? So this is the, these are the two. Type. Nest ba in, in uh, standards uh, 800-63, again, you don't have to memorize these things. Yani. They define the electronic user authentication as the process of establishing confidence in user identities that are presented electronically to an information system. Same, same thing. So you need to present your identities to an information system. This system asks you for this information. You put this information, and then based on that, it gives you like some uh, uh, way of uh, uh, uniquely identifying yourself in any form of that. It gives you a user ID and password. It, give you, it gives you a token. Maybe it gives you both. Okay? Anything okay, that uniquely identifies you. Okay? Based on this registration or uh, information step. System can use authenticated ident identity to determine if the authenticated individual is authorized to perform a particular function. And when you log on to Masan Blackboard, okay, so when you create your student ID and so on and so forth, this is the registration step. Based on that, you give your student ID and you give your password, then you gain access to Blackboard. Okay, so this is the verification step. So in many cases, the authentication and transaction or other authorized function take place across an open Networks such as the internet. This is where the problem. This is the, the real problem. That if, if I'm trying to do everything on a local machine, okay, on Windows, let's say, okay, so you can uh, enter your user ID and password to Windows, and Windows can locally okay, verify your credentials, right? And then it gives you access to Windows. Everything is done on, on a local machine. That's fine. Yani I can accept the fact that I can present my, my password message in clear text, although even this does not happen yet. We'll tell you why. Okay? But to do this on a local machine is different from presenting your identity and your credentials through an open network. So do you imagine that in order to authenticate ourselves, مثلا, to gain access to Blackboard, that we have to send our password in clear text to go to a particular server for a verification? <clears throat> no, of course, we cannot do that. Okay? So that, that, that actually, that point motivates the fact that we need to have a way through which that we cannot really present our credentials, okay, uh, 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 in exposed ways, especially for open networks. 
especially if we want to authenticate a user, okay, in an open network, okay. So authentication, when it's done in an open network, is different from a closed network or a local machine. Okay? Type. So equally authentication and subsequent authorization can take place locally, such as across a local area network or a local machine. Okay? So if we do that in a local area network or a private network or a local machine, maybe the requirement is not that huge. It's not that critical. You, we, we can allow the password to be in clear text. There's no problem because the password is not, not going to be exposed through the network or through the internet for any eavesdropper to read the password. So the requirement might be different if you are authenticating yourself on a local machine or a private network or an open network. Magica? So this is the, uh, 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 the, um, the, the authentication architectural model. Okay, yeah, and the authentication model or the security model uh, uh, regarding authentication that NEST uh, defined in that uh, standard document. It uses some specific terminology, which later on we will see that in all the security standards that we'll talk about, that this terminology is different, has been you know uh, changed. Okay, but yet they they uh, consider some generic names. Okay, so for example, they define the concept of a subscriber, a subscriber or a claimant, which is a user, yeah. <laughs> a user is trying to authenticate himself, herself. Okay, so this is the first step, and it's, this step is done offline, which means that this is done offline to just present your uh, identity or or, or uh, your information or yeah, in in a, in, in, a, in simple term create your account yeah. okay offline okay before having access to any service or server or network entity okay so the claimant in that case they will they will do some user registration so this is number one so user registration okay so, which means that you will enter back your information, your uh, uh, date of birth, for example, your name, last name, first name, things like that. If you are, مثلا, creating an account, مثلا, in, uh, uh, in U.S. immigration, would you think that it can really tolerate any kind of uh, vagueness? No, طبعا, they will have to ask you for back a QID, your passport number, and so on, and so they, they, they don't have any tolerance to have any kind of vagueness in that case. So, which means that this user registration step might be very loose or might be very, very rigorous, okay? It might actually accept some uh, uh, tolerance in the sense that you may have two users with the same name. Like, for example, if you enter Nassan, first name Amr, last name Muhammad, well, chances are, if you, uh, if you Nassan, query Nassan on Google system, definitely you'll find hundreds of people with the first name Amr, with the last name Muhammad. You will, you will find lots of them, right? But if you go to US immigration or any kind of service like this, of course, la, other information that uniquely identifies that this is indeed that person and not any other person. Okay? So this is the first step. Based on that, but the system gives you identity proof. So based on that, I give you. And this is actually step number four or five. So from the user registration, we, we give that information. So this is actually step two. So step two here, I give your information to another system that creates some identity proofing for you, right? That I can give back to you, okay? So for example, if I do this in Google, uh, Masalan uh, service, then I get, okay, so khalas, and I entered my, uh, uh, my user name, okay? And I entered my, or selected my password. So based on that, okay, so my, my identity or my uh, identity proofing will be the username at gmail.com and the password is the password that I have selected. So this is the identity proofing in that case. Sometimes the system might give you credentials and token. Okay? So a system like, Masan, imagine that you are entering مثلا, uh, the cinema. Okay? Again, you give your ID or you give anything to the, مثلا, to the registration. And then based on that, they give you a ticket. This ticket allows you to access a movie for a certain period of time. And after this, this, this ticket will be 
will be expired, will be useless after this. Okay? So similar, similarly, sometimes, or in many ways, tokens gives you identity proofing, but limited with time. So you can use that to authenticate yourself to the system, but for a certain period of time. Maybe? Type. So this is the A, the uh, registration part, which is done offline. Once you do this, خلاص. يبقى احنا كده تمام. Okay. So here, بقى, this is the online part. فضل. Offline in the sense that يعني you do this before gaining access to any part of the system or to a file or to anything. So this, this, this step is a prerequisite to be able to access anything. Hence the name offline. Offline معناها ان انا مش بعمل يعني هي still it can be done uh, مثلا using a web browser. If you call this online, ماشي it's online مش مشكلة بس اقصد ان this, this step is done before gaining access to any part of the system. Which is basically, and then I'm trying to create an account to identify myself to the system. But what we need the internet and communication. Can I just, I don't have anything in Google. Can I just start using Gmail? You have to do what, what's the first step? Create an account, right? I want create an account. If you if, if if the word offline confuses you, خلاص ما مش offline from Google. يعني offline from any Google service. Okay, so you have to do this step, offline from accessing any Google service. Yeah, this is this step is the only step that access publicly. Anyone can access it. Okay, before gaining access to any part of the Google services. واضح كده؟ طيب based on that the claimant بقى since the claimant دلوقتي or the subscriber has the credentials and or the token or both or something like this he or she can now بقى present this token to to gain access to this so the, the way it does that is that okay so first it presents the uh, uh, this credentials and or the token to the, to the verifier okay of course the identity proofing will have been exchanged in the back scene بقى خلاص يعني راحت بقى للداتابيز okay so at google now based on this step your credentials and your identity has moved to the verifier the verifier now needs to receive your credential information and or the token okay based on the verification step it now it gives you access to a reliant party. This reliant party is the service that you want to have access to. So based on that, you have what we call authenticated session. So you have a communication channel directly between you and the service or the server. Between me and Blackboard. Okay. Now I have an authenticated session, which means that this session is secure, and whatever happens on this session, my identity is always known through this session. Verified. Verified, yeah. Guaranteed, yeah. Mashikira? So more often than not, by the way, the authentication part or the verification part, even if you access, مثلاً, uh, even if you access Blackboard, the, the authentication part is done by another server, by the way. They use another server to verify your identity. Then and only then they give you access to Blackboard. Okay, why? Because the, the user authentication service is a centralized service. You, you, you authenticate yourself once, regardless of any service you want to access. Mashi? Yani, that's why you have the same user ID and password. If you want to access Blackboard, you can. If you want to access MyQU, you can. If you want to access any other service in the university, you can. صح? Through one يعني, credential or one identity. صح كده? So that's the, the relying party. So once I verify your identity, I can give you access to whatever you are asking for. Once I give you that access, now you have authenticated session directly between you and the service, being by Blackboard, MyQU, whatever. So this is the, the authentication 
model as it's detailed by the NEST standards. Maybe. The same thing we will see, but with some bad changes when we talk about a specific uh, a protocol specification. So remember this terminology and these things, and you will see that they, they slightly change when we, talk, when we start to talk about a particular standard. Type. So the means of authentication, there are four general means for authenticating a user. By authenticating a user, we mean that we, we need to identify this user by something. By something, right? What is that something by? It could be something that the individual knows, like PIN number, PIN number, uh, like uh, any personal identification number. For example, if you want to identify yourself to a tax system, tax system, مثلاً, for the U.S., they have what we call tax identification number. Anything, any kind of an identification number that identifies you for that system. This is something that the individual knows. It could be something that the, that the individual possesses. Like what? Like, مثلاً, uh, uh, cryptographic keys. I give you any kind, any kind of device, hard, hardware, imagine, that has cryptographic number or random number that only you know. Okay? And when you put this number, it uniquely identifies you to the system. Imagine? So this is something that the individual possesses. Imagine? Yeah, basically doing the same with your yeah so I, yeah, when I used to work in IBM of Canada, they used to give us like hardware tokens. Yeah. Hardware tokens. It's like a device. When you want to authenticate yourself to the system, there is a number appears, and it changes every, every now and then. It changes. This number changes. But when you put this number to the system, it uniquely identifies this token, which is only possessed by you. So they identify you through that token. Okay? Type. Um, so uh, more often than not, this is called the, a token. That's, that's why this token... One token, it gives you access to the system for a certain period of time. It, can, it may actually change. After some time, it changes. Okay? Or it may be just once. Similar to a ticket with cinema or something. Something that the individual is. <laughs> something in you. Like, for example, your iris, your fingerprint, something like that. Any kind of biometric. Static biometric thing. Or something that the, that the individual does. You see examples like mass recognition of voice pattern. Okay, sometimes I can activate or I can authenticate myself. But this requires some voice recognition using machine learning and something like that. You see? Or, yeah, or signature, صح? or any kind of signature. Yes. Um, so this is for user authentication. This is one part. The second part, we talk about the, the symmetric key distribution. Symmetric key distribution. Using symmetric key encryption. So now we talk about symmetric key distribution using, using a symmetric key encryption. So symmetric key, we talk about the same key, and we want to distribute this key to two parties to be able to communicate. How can we do this? One, one thing we just talked about, which is Diffie Hellman. That's one thing, okay? But we said that for Diffie Hellman, it's not, it's actually, it's prone to man in the middle attacks. So the two parties must share the same key, and that key must be protected. So uh, frequent key changes are usually desirable to limit the amount of data compromised if an attacker happens to, a, to learn the key. So as we said, that the lifetime of the key should be shorter than any time that the attacker can use to guess the key, right? So, so we should always keep that in mind, which means that this key should change. That's why we have two types of keys, by the way. We have something called long-term keys, or we call it some, sometimes permanent keys, and we have short keys or temporary keys, okay? So we don't change. But you can, you can run Defi Hellman after a certain period of time. Yeah, Defi Hellman gives you the mechanism. Here we're talking about the protocol. The protocol can use the mechanism in any way. 
Okay? We can use it back in different times. We can use Diffie Hellman at some point and then we use another uh, key distribution technique other than Diffie Hellman at another time. We are designing a protocol. Now we know the mechanisms, so we can use them in any way, shape, or form. We can use it in any level, physical layer or data link layer. So here we have two things. We have key distribution techniques and we have key management techniques. We didn't talk about key management. We, we, we talked a little bit about key distribution. One thing is the Fihelman. But this is the means for delivering the key to, to, to the two parties. OK? One, one way is to have a you know, uh, physical way. Uh, I call an office boy. <laughs> Take this envelope, give it to Muhammad. Take this envelope, give it to Amr. OK? That's OK. Yes, that's it. This, this is one of the ways. Okay? So, so yeah, for, yeah, for car, for as primitive as this method is, but can be used. That's one key distribution thing. Okay? But there is key management. Given a large number of keys, ba, yani how do we generate these keys in such a way? Yani ta, el, el keys di ba, ta andak, ta andak kida pool of keys. Okay, these keys are generated using very large random sequence we generated, صح? Okay, for people who started working on assignment two, they know what I'm talking about, okay, which is only one. I know, okay. So you have, you have these keys generated using like some random sequence. You can generate very long random sequence and break it down into keys, right? Okay, key management talks about which of these parts that we should distribute or dispatch to two parties to use it for communication in such a way that there is like some minimum correlation between these keys, مثلا. Okay? So for example, if two parties use this key and two parties use this key, there is a chance that there is overlap or there is Avis dropper that if they know this key, then they know this key, something like that. So there is some kind of correlation. Because as we said, we can generate large random sequence but as we said, predictability is an issue. If we generate very, very large sequence, then there is a chance that there is some correlation between the different parts. صح? So the larger the, 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 the key sequence is, the more possibility it can be predicted. Okay? So key management here talks about which parts of this random sequence we should dispatch to different parties in order to use it as a, a symmetric key for uh, communication, right? And whether or not that we can allow certain correlation or no correlation at all, how much correlation we can allow and so on. This area, by the way, is not very highly, uh, extensively addressed in the literature. But this is required. Key management is required. And usually this is done by a server. We call it key distribution center. <coughs> so the key distribution center needs to have this key management technique in such a way that it generates very large sequence, and then it takes by some of these keys, and then it it gives it to the different parties to use it for communication. We control the life cycle. Of the we control the life cycle exactly, exactly. Mashikil. So, so what are the possible key distribution ways for symmetric key? Huh? Here we're talking about symmetric key. So a key can be selected by A and physically delivered to B. Uh, office boy uh, approach. <laughs> okay. Uh, e, a selects that. But طبعا, this, is, this is given that B trusts A. Why would I trust you? A question might be asked, right? Then if we don't trust each other, then we have to have a third party that selects the key for us. Nishi? Similar to the bank. A bank generates these pen numbers, and then it gives it to the users. Okay, gives it to A, gives it to B, gives it to A and B for communication, whatever. I told you, why do I start, uh, I trust the bank? No, there, is, has, there has to be someone that, <laughs> okay? The only exception for this is that a blockchain, blockchain, no one trusts no one. <laughs> That's a different uh, game. That's why, Blockchain was a disruptive thing because it allows zero trust. Huh? But see, trust, trust by the crowd. The trust comes from the crowd, right? But here, 
okay, we talk about that there is an entity that we have to trust. If B trusts A, then it can get the key from it. If B does not trust A, then we both have a third party to trust, and this third party will deliver the key for us, or to us. Maybe. If A and B have previously or recently used a key يعني, to secure a communication, okay, then they can exchange the new key on this secure channel. But that assumes that we need to have أصلاً, a secure communication through another key. Okay? And that, this is by exactly the concept that we use permanent key and we use temporary key. The permanent key is the one that we use to secure channel in order to communicate the temporary key. The temporary key is the one that we, we change a lot. Mashi? So there is a long term key, there is a short term key. What? So what if the permanent key becomes key? The permanent key is used only to communicate the temporary key. That's it. And then you use the temporary key for communication. And in the third part, طبعا اه ثيرد ذير از ذا سيم لا مش لا ثيرد بارتي مش دارس ثيرد بارتي ذيس از سمون ذات وي تراست رايت رايت ذاتس ان ايشو يا ذاتس ان ايشو بس ريمبر اف ذيس از اونلي اف ذيس از اونلي يوز تو كومينيكيت ذا كي هاو اوفن دو وي اكسشينج ذا كي ويتش مينز هاو ماتش انفورميشن دارس هاز اكسس تو ات ماشي ذيس از كونترولد باي ذا شورت تيرم كي وي توك اباوت ذا لونج تيرم Yeah, the long-term key, you said the long-term key is per, uh, semi-permanent, yeah. Oh, it's it's right. available for duration of, for a very long duration of time. Mm -hmm. But I thought your question is, if it's available for a very long duration of time, that gives enough time for Dart to guess it. Right. Sah? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that could be, that could be an issue. Mm -hmm. That could be an issue. But again, uh, Dart needs to have access to some information, like some uh, cipher text, in order to, to try to minimize the amount of time to guess. Okay? But this channel is only used for guessing the, for, sorry, for communicating the short-term key. Right? So that's why it's not frequently used. So Darth will not have access to much information that allows Darth to, a, to guess this key very quickly. But when we say it's permanent, permanent is actually limited by time as well. ماشي؟ It's not forever. He's man in the middle. So لا لا man in the middle is something else. Man in the middle assumes that I can really pretend that I am Bob to Alice or I am Alice to Bob. That's another thing. But this assumes that I already have compromise to Alice and I already have compromise to Bob. I know something about Alice and I know something about Bob. طيب if A and B they both have secured channel with the third party, then they can get that key from the third party through the key, the, 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 the type. The, there are, that's why there are two types of keys, as we said. There is a session key or the temporary key. And this changes very often, sometimes every few seconds. Sometimes every few seconds. In, 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 in typical protocols, in every few seconds, these kind of keys, they have to change. And sometimes this is a bit expensive. And there is a trade-off between a few seconds, meaning like two seconds or 10 seconds. That depends on the criticality of the system, the application, what level of communication we're talking about, based on so many things. And there is permanent key. And when we talk about permanent key, we don't mean permanent like forever. Huh? But the permanent has a limit, but see, it's used for distributing, using, usually used for distributing the session keys, the temporary keys. Okay? لا السيشن كيز لا هو بالك هو انا يعني هو لك باختصار شديد هو اللي بيحصل ايه؟ When you authenticate yourself to the system okay the system creates some kind of a permanent a permanent key it's like it actually gets gets generated independently between you and the system that you're trying to access we'll see how how it's done okay the main purpose of this permanent key is for both of you you and the system to locally generate a bunch of keys, which we call it session keys. All of them together, we call them the security context for this session. Okay? This security context for this session generate a bunch of keys. Why a bunch of keys? Why not just one session key? 
No, because there is a key for confidentiality, there is a key for uh, integrity, there is a key for non-repudiation, there is a key for uh, uh, creating initial vectors, there, is, yeah, I mean, there are so many keys, by the way. Okay? This uh, security context have to be renewed and refreshed every now and then. But all of it is, a, is again, is taken from the permanent key. Sometimes we use uh, random, uh, sorry, pseudo-random functions, if you remember. We use pseudo-random functions to generate multiple keys, but again, all of them are based on the permanent key. Anyway. Type. So uh, 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 the key distribution center grants the systems to establish a connection and provides a one-time session key. And we see about how this is done. It works as follows. When A wishes to set up a connection to B, it transmits a connection request to the A to the uh, connection request pa packet yeah, to the key distribution center. So it sends a request to the key distribution center to say, I want to communicate to B. So we don't communicate directly to B. We don't send that request to B. La. We send to a third party that we know that we both trust. OK? The sender, the sender yes, the sender will do that. Because if I, if I try to, to directly communicate with B, I mean, this, this kind of communication is not secure. Because, because remember, here we don't have a key yet. No. A, send a request to B, then B will communicate to them. No, this is not what happens. To B. To B. La, this is not what happens. What happens, la, again, uh, wa, the key distribution center is the one that distributes the, the session keys. Okay? So we'll see now. A, set, it, it wishes to set up a communication to B. Then it transmits a connection request to the key WC through the encrypted link using the master key. So there is a master key that secures the communication between E and the key distribution center. Between A and sorry, between A and the key distribution center. And of course, there is another permanent key to secure the communication between the key distribution center and B. So when I send the request to communicate with B, I send it to the KDC. Okay? Then KDC will say, oh, okay. So if B accepts that. I'm going to generate locally a session key. Okay, sometimes this session key is a function of both permanent keys of A and B. Okay, so I use the permanent key of A, a permanent key of B, combine both with some properties, and I feed that to a pseudo random function which generates session a, a session key. And then this session key is unified. I send it to A and I send it to B through the, so through the secure channel. Once I send that key, now it can talk to me directly. Meshi? Meshi. Taib. We talked about that sequence. Taib. I added this slide just to, bardo uh, to try to motivate your thinking because what, what is the complexity of key management when we talk about uh, a distributed system of like n different nodes, okay, so I have n nodes that try to talk to each other, okay? Any two nodes can talk to each other amongst all these n nodes. So if I have symmetric key, okay, how many of these keys do I need in a distributed system that has n different nodes? Regardless, that, a node can represent a server, a node can represent a client, a node can represent anything, yeah? No, no, not n keys, of course, because you have any two combinations of these n nodes. صح? So that's why it's n, co a, n combination 2. Any two of these nodes can, a, can communicate with each other. So it's n c2. Okay? So you can have a key between this and this. You can have a key between this and this, and so on. Okay, such that these keys are not repeated. So the key that A uses to communicate to B is the same key that B uses to communicate to A. Okay, that's why one key for two. One key for two. So it's N C two. So N C two. This is this is O of N square, sah? Sah kida? Okay. If I talk about public public cryptography, then regardless, 
each node will have two keys, one private and one public. صح? So it's A, it's 2N, which means it's O of A of N, right? So this is the, this is the reason that we say sometimes that people would say uh, public key cryptography is very efficient in terms of key distribution. Yeah, this is right. This is true. But one thing, for one thing, public key cryptography, it does not have zero cost in terms of key distribution. No, we still have to do key distribution. It's O of N. Uh, it's better than N squared, صح. But on the other side, keep in mind that uh, symmetric encryption is much less in terms of complexity. Encryption complexity here is much less based on the same size of the key. So if you have the same size of the key for symmetric encryption or public encryption, you will see that symmetric encryption has less complexity. Isn't that bad in terms of encryption? لا لا لا. I'm not saying لا. I'm not saying uh, uh, complexity in terms of uh, complexity to hack it. I'm saying the amount of cost you need to generate the cipher text. But in order to hack it, you always have to guess the key. Okay, so, so for the same size of key, which means that the cost to hack it is the same, but in terms of generating the cipher text, the symmetric encryption is less complex. So this is good. So this is good. And that's why significant. I, I don't know how much. It's significant. So that's why they often use public encryption for key distribution. So they use it only to distribute the symmetric key on both sides. Once they, 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 uh, they exchange the symmetric key on both sides, they use symmetric encryption for communication. Hatta for message authentication codes and so on. Especially if you use CMAC. Because HMAC does not use encryption also. What? For Hmm? Should be a limit. Here I'm talking about N nodes that all of them they want to communicate with each other in pairs. Okay? Yeah, I know in distributed systems you don't have the scenario that all of the nodes want to communicate with all the nodes at the same time. So I understand that. Which means that of course the number of keys that I need to manage in the system at some point is definitely way below this number. I know that. Sah. But Sahina, I'm talking about the worst case scenario. But of course, the keys should be unique, right? Each. Of course. Of course. Of course. This, this means that these are different keys, definitely. Isn't there some scenarios that more than two uh, users... Sah. This is for group communication. You're right. For group communication, is different. How different? No, because, because one node, to talk to multiple nodes using a multicast, they use what we call group keys. Okay? So it becomes by a NC3 or NC4, depending on how many nodes communicate in the same group. That's another story. That's another story. The, eh? Is it covered in the... In, a, in, the, in the course, yeah? No. <laughs> <laughs> in the course, well, in, oh, in the course, yeah. in the course, we will talk about the group communication in the course. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> A lot to come. Meshi, okay. Yeah, we have a little bit of time. Yeah, five ten minutes, and then we'll break. So we'll talk about, about now that we talked about user authentication, and we talked about key distribution with the different pros and cons and properties and so on. So now, we start to talk about a particular standard. Some protocol standard, okay, which is called Kerberos. This is uh, actually developed by MIT. Okay? So this is uh, one of the first uh, protocols that was de facto standard. يعني, it's widely used. And uh, it's used to, for user authentication and key distribution in distributed systems, where you have a user wants to gain access to a local machine or to a machine over an open network. Okay, using by all the properties that we talked about. So assume a distributed environment in which users at workstations, they wish to access services on servers. So I am, I'm gaining access to a local machine, يعني مثلا Windows machine. 
and I want to gain access to a remote server which, which is on open network. ماشي. Servers then need to restrict access to the authorized user, not only by the identity, but sometimes restricted based on time. Come on. Hmm? So I give you some, for example, some ticket or some token to access this server, but if you leave it open, idle for a certain period of time, then it expires. Then you have to renew. I have to renew the the security context again. Okay, which means that I will give you a temporary token to access it, but then after this token expires, then خلاص. It's like يعني you are taking a ticket to watch a movie in the cinema. خلاص after the after the movie finishes, your ticket expires. خلاص. طيب. So in this environment, a workstation cannot be trusted to identify its users correctly to the network services because of it. Because a user may gain access to a particular workstation. And pretend to be another user operating from that workstation. So it's like, يعني كده بالضبط يعني. So here, you have a legitimate user, okay, that has access to this local machine through some credentials and so on. Windows, مثلا يعني. Okay. So another user may try to access the same local machine as if. He is that user, and to do that, this user needs to know the user ID and password. Meshi. So that's a that's one thing that, of course, we need to avoid. And this is easy. I mean, we need to try to make the 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 well and the password hidden. Saniyan, if if that if that legitimate user leaves that local machine unattended for a certain period of time, then Everything expires, and we need to log on again. Things like that, ماشي. Which need, which means that again, this local user, the legitimate user, needs to have access to this local machine for a certain period of time. And if it's idle for a certain period of time, then, خلاص, everything finishes, and we have to do this thing again. A user may alter a network address of a workstation so that a request sent from altered workstation appear to come from the Impersonated workstation, and what that means is, okay, so the local user, sorry, the legitimate user, accessing this machine, and this machine is trying to access some servers, some services on the distributed systems, Blackboard, MyQ, things like that, صح? And these servers, they see a request coming from this user. On this workstation, workstation is identified by what? IP address. Nishi? Okay? So it sees that it's this user and the request is coming from this workstation, so everything looks fine. Okay? Attacker? Smart. Okay. I will compromise a local machine on the distributed system. I will change that machine. خلاص بقى I have to compromise I, I compromise this machine I will program this machine to send requests as if it's coming from that user from this workstation which means that I will alter the message to have the IP address of this machine okay so now I'm accessing the network and different services okay Using a pretended user on a pretended machine. So this is that what the hackers usually use to a to have like first to compromise one machine on the on the security system and then to use that this machine to send requests to different services, okay, to a to pretend that this is a legitimate user working from a legitimate machine and getting access to all these services. Barakina. Of course, that's that that scenario we want to avoid. Meshi, so we want to now design a key distribution and authentication system or protocol to avoid all these scenarios. Of course, so this is like this is the attack model, if you will. Meshi, a user may even drop taban on exchanges and use replay attack. So, okay, so I don't have access to IP address. I don't have access to this ID and password. ماشي. I can 
Eve is dropped on packets, okay? And in a later stage, replay these packets again. We talked about this replay attack, simple replay attack. Replay attack is one of the simplest, okay? And again, it's one of the simplest to mitigate. Using what? Hmm? How do we mitigate replay attack? Hadfakir? Hmm? Using? Hmm? How do we mitigate a replay attack? لا حتى even if authenticated the user you added the message authentication codes حل I will I will copy the whole thing okay and in a later stage I will send it again same thing so the message is authenticated the message is not altered صح I did not I did not modify the message I did not modify the message authentication code hmm at the hashing, well, everything is in the message authentic. What is eh? Ma'ho non repetition da ma'naha an huwa again, um, I, I need to I uniquely identify the source to say that the source is, is the one that's sending. Yes, the message contains everything in it. Having a signature. Lah, ma'ho signature bardo guarantees. Guarantees. Aywa. أيوة اللي هو لا it's not we have to store أيوة الله ينور عليك we have to store one of two things we have to store a sequence number in the message and this sequence number is part of the encrypted part so even the attacker does cannot access it okay so if I see that the 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 sequence number is went is is going like one two three four five and then one خلاص يعني it's واضح okay so this one is a is a replay or I I always have to store this the, the, the timestamp in the message so the timestamp tells me that this message is always fresh very simple yeah okay so that's the so these are the scenarios or the attack ways that we want to eat to as part of this so for this but yeah, objectives. Uh, the Kerberos. Kerberos. Taban Kerberos comes from a um, a Greek word. It's like a Greek name for one of the famous people. Not that we carry in. But Kerberos has been developed by MIT, and it's for authentication and key distribution, based on the concept of KDC, the key distribution center. It provides a centralized authentication center. This is what we talk about. That there is some, sometimes they call it LDAP if you have, someone have heard about this. Yes, yes, yes. They use, they, they call it LDAP. So this is like a centralized server that's used exclusively, almost exclusively for user authentication or for user verification, identity verification specifically. So it relies exclusively on symmetric key encryption. There's no public key here. This is yani, so we need to generate a key that distributed to a to uh, between the user and the service or the, the server that this user wants to have access to. Yes. Okay. So there are two versions. There is uh, version four and version five. The uh, the also ver the uh, version five corrects some of the security deficiencies in version four. Not that version four again. Uh, is مثلاً, uh, is deficient or something. The idea is that version four might be using something like this, and again, this as a as an uh, as a security algorithm uh, is 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 prone to attacks. Not again because of deficiency in this itself, but because of the key length, key length right? Lower fifty six bits. Yeah, but it's easier to attack. But again, in, in version 5, they recommended the use of AES or something like this to make it robust. That's, that's it. Not that it's deficient in any way. Okay? Okay, let's go now. Let's go now. Let's go now. Let's go now. Okay.